you have your Bibles, we'll talk today about adding value to your life. We'll go to Acts chapter 20, chapter 20 verse 24. Oh, it's nice to see excited kids, isn't it? Hallelujah. If you don't pass the baton on to the next generation, you just lost the race. Paul is meeting with the elders in Ephesus. He's saying goodbye to them. He knows it's the last time he's ever going to see them by the Holy Spirit. He knows this. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, Paul said an amazing thing. He said, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Why? So that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the good news of the grace of God. How much in one verse? To testify solemnly. You know, the grace of God is an awesome message, but it's also a solemn message. Because those who refuse it are really in a mess. And those who receive it, it's just too good to be true. But he said, I'm here to testify solemnly. And he said, because of this, I don't consider my life at all dear to myself. How can you not consider your life dear to yourself? Now let's hear this before. How do you add value to your life? Why would anybody sow their life as a seed for the kingdom of God? I'm here to tell you today that it is only going to happen if you can understand the value that living for the next life adds to this life and the next. Here's the answer. It says, um, let me explain this. Sometimes I have something in my home I don't need anymore, I don't want it anymore, but it's kind of valuable. It'll be valuable to somebody. And my first thought is, okay, I should sell this. But my next thought is, it's way more valuable as a seed. Now, I know you've heard us say this, but everything you own is more valuable as a seed than it is on Craigslist. I don't, yeah, some, nah, you make your head go tilt. I, after thinking about selling it, I realized that if I add love to that item and give it with great love into either an individual Christian's life or into the ministry, that thing takes on an exponentially greater value than a few bucks all by itself. Now, I want you to understand why. And you say, where are we going with this? Why don't you hopefully think of something that you could give away and why it's more. And then, would it make sense to give your life away? Think. All right, so why is it more valuable as a seed? Number one, there's three reasons. Number one, I get the joy of giving. There's a joy of giving that doesn't happen when I exchange it for some for money, somebody on Craigslist. That I get the joy of giving. Number two, the Lord gets the joy of watching me become more like Jesus. Have you ever seen your kids make a tremendously good decision and you didn't want to say too much because you didn't want to follow with that, but you, your heart just swells with pride. Oh, thank God, they're getting it. They're getting it. It's so cool. Come on, parents. Have any of you seen your child be polite or kind or thoughtful and you thought, oh, they're getting it. If I can give that gift instead of selling it, my father says, ah, oh, she's getting it. So I have joy. The father has joy. And third of all, that individual has joy. My brother or sister has the joy of receiving through the pure agape love that has nothing in return. You ever been blessed by somebody over the top and they wanted absolutely nothing in return? There's a joy in that. You feel love. You understand the love of God. In, in Acts, the same chapter, if you look at verse 35, Paul quotes the Lord Jesus. And Paul says, In everything I showed you that by working hard in this manner, you must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he himself said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. Now the world hears that and says, uh-huh, that's great. I'll, you go ahead and give and I'll, I'll receive. Yeah. They think it's more blessed to receive, but the Lord Jesus himself said it's more blessed to give. Now, I told you the first three things I get a joy in giving. Father gets a joy in seeing me grow up. The person gets a joy in receiving, but beyond that, the love of God has added a life to that financial seed, and there will be a harvest. Jesus said, give and it will be given to you. He didn't even just say, give to New Life Ministries or give to a church. He said, give. Yeah. Every time we give, it produces a harvest. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Today, we want to see that this process of divine generosity 
starts a flow of kingdom life in the life of every person that this touches. Would you say this with me? The process, the process. Of, divine of divine generosity starts the flow of kingdom life, flow of kingdom life. In, every it in every person it touches. I have a thought that came to me yesterday that I can't get out of my mind and I will remember as long as I live. Think of the omnipotent one, the omniscient one, the one who has always been. We can't get our mind about the fact he has no beginning, but how many believe he has no beginning, even though we can't grasp it. Question. How in the world could anybody add anything to the value of his life? Amen. He is the all in all, but he added value. Do you know how he did? He took on a body and so did as a seed. And Jesus Christ has more value today than he did before the cross. Yeah. Think of that a while. You want a life with value added? Ha! Let's read it again. We'll go back to verse 24 if we could. But I do not consider my life, read it with me, but I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the good news of the grace of God. Jesus Christ saw that even though he was eternal and divine, if his life would take on added value, he would add a, fa a family to the Father, a bride to himself, for eternity, if he would sow his life as a seed. The ultimate divine generosity was not in just giving us rain for our crops, but giving us his Son for our Savior. How could the everlasting, immortal, divine life of God himself have added value? By giving it away. Amen. And you say... What is this for us? Everybody who went on this trip, everybody who's new in God, please listen. The enemy will tell you you have so little understanding of the word or so little knowledge of the word, you can't help your friends at school. Please hear me. Your friends at school are desperate for the divine revelation you have that Jesus Christ changed your life this weekend. You don't have to be a, a, have a doctor of divinity to say, Jesus Christ healed my body. Jesus Christ changed my life. Now, we're going to read in this chapter that the one thing Paul said is, I did not withhold that. I did not withhold the truth from you. I did not shrink back from telling. And I began to finally realize that one of the ways we sow our lives as a seed is by never shrinking breaking back on giving the truth out to people who need it because of our own selfishness, worried about what they say. The Lord Jesus Christ chose to give up this world's gratification, temporary gratification, for heaven's eternal gratification. He chose to die to himself in this life to live for the next. Now I want you to see the meaning of the word gratification. Now and before, listen, before we get word with this, you have to understand God still wants you to enjoy a good meal in a restaurant. He wants you to have a nice home. He wants, But those things become secondary. I, heard, I love what I heard one preacher say yesterday. He said, when I write with the Lord, a meal just tastes better. Everything about life is sweeter when you're right with God. And being right with God means that your life is available to Him 24-7, 365 days a year. And on leap year, it's 366. Because your whole focus is outward on giving instead of inward on taking. Amen. Interesting, huh? This is the meaning of gratification. Read it with me. Reward, recompense, satisfaction, or pleasure. Now, when Paul said, I do, not I do not count my life as dear to myself, he grew up privileged. He grew up with parents who could give him the Harvard education of the day. He grew up at the feet of Gamaliel. That day, they didn't have Harvard or Yale. They had scholars who were preeminent in their field, and if you paid enough, your kid could sit at their feet and learn. That's what Paul got. Saul of Tarsus was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He could have been in Jerusalem receiving the highest honor, the highest reward this life had to offer. But he said, I don't count that dear. Now I ask you, how can you not count dear what's the best this life has to offer? Because he saw what the next life had to offer. There are rewards and recompenses in this life and the next. And Paul, as you know, gave up many of the comforts of civilization to pioneer churches. All, where nobody had ever heard the gospel. Now think of this. Paul understood that his highest calling was not born in time, but in eternity. Your highest calling
calling on your life and the greatest value added that will ever come to your life does not come from this world. It came, it was birthed in eternity before you were birthed on earth. There's a call on your life that will add, think of where, okay, let's stop. I just got done telling you that he was born in Tarsus to a wealthy family who could afford the best education of the day. And he said, ooh, we all get titillated by the fact that somebody's been to Harvard or somebody's been to Yale or they have a huge mansion. But let me tell you what Paul got in exchange for that. He is touching millions of lives around the earth today in 2018 because he wrote Romans. And we have our total basis of theology in Romans. Because he wrote 1st and 2nd Corinthians. 1st Corinthians where we're given the love chapter and the gifts of the Spirit. 2nd Corinthians, that epistle of comfort that reigns, has brought comfort to people for 2,000 years. He has affected lives. When your mama was teaching you things on 1st Corinthians 13 when you were 3 years old, you didn't know that the Apostle Paul would still be still speaking. You know how it says of Abel, though dead, he still speaks. The Apostle Paul's life has a grandeur that nothing on this earth could even as imagined let alone surpass. If you choose to live only for this life, God will love you, but you will forego a recompense that you'll wish you hadn't forgone. Many people will be helped if you'll give your life to the calling God has put on it. Jesus Christ, divine, eternal, everlasting life, took on added value because he sowed it as a seed. Now let's keep reading here. If you're in Acts chapter 20, we want to read some of these verses. They're very profound. From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus, called to him the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia how I was with you the whole time. Serving the Lord with all humility and tears and trials which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. So there were some there were some rough moments, weren't there? <coughs> but you know why he came through in victory every time. Yeah. He got shipwrecked four times. It says three times, but he actually had a fourth one added on after he wrote the letter. He got shipwrecked four times and lived four times. He never died until he decided to to lay his life down as a martyr. And you say, Oh, that's horrible. Hey, you know the one moment here and we're next minute there. Hallelujah. Now look at verse 20. You know how I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house. Paul did not succumb to the political correctness police of 55 AD. How many of you know what's politically correct? What's politically correct is to say everything goes. Anything goes, however your living goes. Everybody goes to heaven. Oh, that person died. We know they're in a better place. We don't know they're in a better place. They're only in a better place if they knew Jesus. And there was so much pressure on us to be nice. Let's all be nice and let everybody go to hell. Okay? And I'm just telling you, if you're going to lay your life down, part of the laying the life down is telling the truth when demons are spitting in your face and you say, I don't care. I love this person more than I love me. And this church, we talked about it Wednesday night. Wednesday night, if you want to get the, the, the uh, CD, Al Fury told about the moves of God he's seen. And it's so exciting that this church, the responsibility on this church is to tell the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the church. The truth is that after you get filled, after you get saved, there is a second experience called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you never receive it, it will cost you. You cannot fulfill the plan of God for your life without the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus said, power will come upon you. And you say, I don't like you saying it. I, I'm, I'm here with Paul. I will not shrink back from declaring to you anything is profitable. It is profitable for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It is not profitable for you to walk away from a divine gift that is that powerful and was paid so much for. It is the, it is the responsibility of this church to explain to people that this is a holy covenant. The reason that you can get healed, stay healed, and live in victory is because this is a covenant God will honor. God will honor you in your finances if you cooperate with his plan. That is the responsibility of this church to tell you the truth. I know a lot of our faith churches that started out telling people this is a covenant. Something happened they couldn't explain, so they said, okay, we'll go back to just saying everything is God's will. I've seen a whole bunch of stuff this week that wasn't God's will. You think it was God's will that somebody walked into that synagogue and murdered 11 people? I don't think so. I know it wasn't. 
There's things that happen in our lives that aren't God's will because we don't use our authority. But fortunately, you can learn. Hallelujah. Yeah. Hallelujah. Let's read it one more time. How I did not shrink back from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly from house to house. Now, I want you to make this in, the first half of this into a confession and say, I will not shrink back from telling anybody anything that's profitable. Say it with me. I will not shrink back from declaring to you anything that is profitable. What that means, kids, if you're at school this week and there's somebody cutting and they're hurting and they're talking about suicide, you don't have a right to shrink back from telling them what they, you found in Jesus. And you say, what if I don't know how to get them saved? Bring them to somebody who does until you learn how to get them saved. I do not believe it's right to, to stop. I know a lot of churches don't talk about the baptism, but the baptism of the Holy Spirit saved my life. I didn't have the power to live for God. We have to tell the truth and the whole truth. Hallelujah. Now, I just want to say this. Whoever loved you enough to get you saved did not shrink back, and they did not care. You have to understand, whoever got you saved paid a price in ignoring how you were treating them. How many of you were super nice to the people trying to get you saved before you got saved? I don't think so. Oh, you were Anna. Anna's been nice her whole life. I know you were. You, Sherry got her saved, and aren't you glad? But she didn't hold back. She she was your neighbor. She loved you like a mother. And she could have said, well, I don't want Anna to, I don't want to lose my friendship with Anna. She's been such a blessing to me. But she loved you enough not to withhold. Amen? Hallelujah. Whoever got you baptized in the Holy Spirit did not shrink back. My grandma told me about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And I loved her, but I wasn't nice to her that year. She was my favorite person on earth, and I wasn't real nice to her that year. I did not, I was an intellectual, I did not need to speak in tongues, and I just held her like this, and afterwards I thanked her profusely many, 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 many times, thank God, but we cannot shrink back, whoever helped you get healed, you know, sometimes people come to you and they say, well, we found a fault with that church you're attending, yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah, but what you do is you ask yourself this, if you know, is a church valuable in my life? If I took everything that has been planted into my life from that church and I took it out, would my life be better off or worse off? And if it's better off, you better learn to ignore some imperfections and hang in there. Hallelujah. Let's read 20 and 21. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable in teaching you publicly and from house to house. Solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks. Now, what did he solemnly testify? Of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not suggesting that you have to become a street corner preacher that says, You're going to hell, you're all going to hell. But, you know, okay, that's probably not the most effective. But at the same time, you and I both know that we've had opportunities of witness when we could have said something tastefully and we backed off. And Paul said, I did not back off. I solemnly testified to both Jews and Greeks that you need to repent and get right with God because if you'll trust in Jesus, he'll save you. Hallelujah. Amen. How do you tell if you're sowing your life as a seed? Very simple. Is your focus inward or is your focus outward? Mm -hmm. it, now, don't get, I'm not, this is, okay, here's where I want to shrink back. Now I shrink back on this one thing. No, I'm not <laughs> If you think about yourself 55 minutes of the hour, you got growing to do. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. If Jesus had thought of himself 55 minutes of the hour, we'd all be on our way to hell. Yeah. He thought of Father and he thought of others every moment that he lived to present a life of perfection and his selfless sacrifice. And you know what? Therefore also God highly exalted him and gave him a name that is there is always promotion when we choose to live unselfishly. Look at verse 22. <coughs> Paul says, and now behold, bound by the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. He says, I'm bound by the Spirit. The truth is that we either live for our own comfort and self-gratification, or we focus on added value as life as a seed. And you say, well, how would you begin? David started adding value to his life as a worshiper at 11 years old. He was out. Do you understand that David could have been born a good shepherd and died a good shepherd? Yeah. That could have been the story of his life. Yeah. But from the beginning, he started adding value as a kid is worshiping. And then that anointing came on his life. God, God's desire for you and for me is to be 
fearless. Amen. I see we have a Marine Anias. Hello? Is that Matt? Oh, that's not Matt. That's Christopher. I looked over and thought you're somebody else. Sorry, Christopher. You're okay. This is I'm sure Navy's the same way. Sorry, Christopher. Not to embarrass you. you from a distance, you look a little like the guy we have in the ring. Not everybody in the Navy's fearless. Everybody in the Navy wants to be fearless, right? Everybody in the Marines wants to be fearless. I suppose everybody in the body of Christ wants to be fearless. But do you, do you know where fearlessness comes from? Dying to yourself. Once you put your life in the hands of God and say it's yours, do whatever you want with it. You don't have to protect your little self-interest and your pride and whether everybody's treating your wife just right and you just right. All of a sudden, you're fearless. David started as a little kid adding value to God. And living for the life beyond that eternal realm. And God honored him with an anointing that was utterly fearless. So the next time we see him, he's 16. All of Israel's future is at stake. That if those Philistines win, God help the women and children. Uh, you understand this? It wasn't like you could appeal to the United Nations. It was over for them. And David's fearlessness, because he had begun to sow his life of seed, that anointing on him, went out there and said, I'll lay down my life, King Saul. You may, your knees may be um, clapping together, but I will kill the guy in the name of the Lord. Yeah. And he lived for something beyond himself. You follow that through, you can see him all of his life, even when he's king. You see, like I said, he could have been born a shepherd, died a shepherd, and we could have met him in heaven because he followed the covenant. But instead of just being born a shepherd and died a shepherd, he said, would you like to have a life? Yeah. I said, yeah, let's do this thing together. Yeah. While he was on the run from Saul, he had opportunity after opportunity to turn selfish. He did. Because Saul tried to kill him and he, he would have been validated in the eyes of his men to murder Saul. But Saul, this is what he said. He said, it is not mine to decide how long the anointed of the Lord lives. God will decide. And over and over and over he lived. For he sowed his honor and his seed and his life into the other realm. And because of it, his throne started out on justice and integrity. And the whole nation changed. The whole nation became worshippers. Later on, when Absalom tried to destroy David, and they brought the Ark of the Covenant along, like a good luck charm, he said, take the Ark of the Covenant back. If God's finished with me, he's finished with me. My life is in his hands. And God honored him. Now, here's a man who sowed his seed. I want you young people to say, oh, it's so scary to sow my life to seed. Well, take a look at the Bible and find out what God does with seeds. Oh. Every ear of corn you've ever eaten happened because one seed was willing to give its life. And you said, but that'd be me and I'd be obliterated. Paul wasn't obliterated. He's walking around heaven getting to me. Everybody in heaven wants to meet Paul. You changed my life. I love Galatians 2.20. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me in the life which I in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. How would you like to have written those scriptures? I don't know about you, but I'm... God will do something with your life that you can't. Paul said, if we can go back to Acts 20.22, Paul said... Now I feel bound. Bound by the Spirit. Why was he bound by the Spirit? Because he had chosen to be a bondservant of the Lord. In the Old Testament, a bondservant is it's a Hebrew slave that you have to let go after six years. And most of them said, bye. And you furnish them and they go. But once in a while, there'd be one who loved his master so much. Who said, I'm not leaving. And he said, never, never. He said, if I take this stuff, I have to go away from here. Yeah, he said, I'm not leaving. And so they would take him to the doorpost, and they would pierce his ear with an awl. And from that point on, he was called a bond slave. When Jude says, a bond slave to the Lord Jesus Christ, when Paul says, that means I could go. I go to heaven without serving him like this, but who would want to? I told you, when Gordon died, I was going to Tulsa. And the deciding factor was... Because I don't want to pastor a church. I wanted to withhold everything. <laughs> and I finally said, if I go to Tulsa, will your presence be as near and sweet? Because we had so many people praying for us. And I knew in my heart the answer, if I go to Tulsa, I'll never know the Lord's presence quite as sweet as if I stay. And I stayed because of that. I'm addicted. 
Paul was addicted. He said, I go bound in the spirit because I am a bond slave of the Lord Jesus. He went willingly, cheerfully, and gladly because he trusted the purposes of God. What motivated Paul to keep going? He kept his eyes on the price set before him. I mean, let me ask you this. David sowed his whole life from the time he was a kid. Does anybody here feel sorry for David? He gave billions of dollars to the temple and still had billions of dollars left. <coughs> Paul, what an honor. Is anybody more honored than the Apostle Paul in heaven except Jesus? I don't know who it would be. To have written all those wonderful books, to have started all the churches. He even evangelized the known world in a lifetime. Amazing. So what keeps us from... Look at what Paul said in Philippians. Even after he had done a whole lot for God, he's in a Philippian jail, and yet look what he says. He says, I'm not trying to get out of this. He says, not that I've already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I, lay, I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brother, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting everything that lies behind and reaching forward. That means the good, the bad, and the ugly. You forget even the successes. Don't, don't get to a certain age and say, well, look what I've done for God. We're going to sit down and lay rest on our laurels. You forget it all. Forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize. Oh, my goodness. Do you know why Christians are living for themselves instead of Jesus? Because they can't see the prize. They've never spent enough time in the presence of God and in the Word of God to realize there's a prize. I'm expecting if I sow my life as a seed, there will be added value. Not only to me, but to everybody in my life. Do you know what happened when they threw a corpse onto Elisha's bones? Look, bring up 2 Kings 13, 21. And you say, well, you're not perfect. No, it's not the perfection of the person. It's the unification in the death of Christ. The moment you become unified with Christ in his death, the resurrection power that hit him hits you and it hits everybody you touch. <clears throat> Once when the Israelites were burying a man, they spied at the end of these raiders so they were enemies. So they hastily threw the corpse into the tomb of Elijah. They just chucked the stiff. They didn't have time to do a proper burial. Okay. They threw the corpse into the tomb of Elisha and fled, but as soon as the body touched Elisha's bones, the dead man revived and jumped his feet. That is the resurrection life that is supposed to be on us. Because, hallelujah. There have been people who have done extraordinary things even though they were born to wealth. Now, it's not, you just said it's hard for the wealthy to figure out how bad they need me. It's hard for the wealthy. How many of you ever heard of Patty Hearst? Some of us are older. You know Patty Hearst? William Randolph Hearst's daughter, she had a sister named Victoria. Victoria got saved in um, Norval Hayes meetings and filled with the Holy Spirit, traveled with him some. She has spent the rest of her life using her fortune to help missionaries from the world. And he said, oh my, oh, she's had a great life. Are you kidding me? She's had a great life. But she saw beyond the boundaries of this little... You can have the biggest mansion in Hollywood and more Facebook likes than the whole world. And it's not even going to be a puff of smoke on that day. Nothing. It will matter. Nothing. Yeah. <sighs> Hallelujah. When Paul caught the glimpse of Jesus' majesty, he traded the life of Saul of Tarsus for a life filled with extraordinary potential and eternal full gratification. If you say this isn't more real to me, okay, how do you get started? You start praying for other people instead of just yourself. You start praying for other people it's just, instead of just you and your family. You've got to start saying, God, enlarge my heart to where I love people even if they're not my flesh and blood. I know a ton of people. The only people they ever give anything to is their kids and grandkids. Well, that's fine. But if you're part of the body of Christ, you've got a bigger family than that. You need a bigger heart than that. Hallelujah. Please remember this. Your highest calling in life was not born in this world. It was birthed in eternity. If you really want to go from being just a shepherd, born a shepherd, died a shepherd, Saul Tarsus has a little better than that. He was born wealthy, educated beyond words. He could have died wealthy with everybody coming and bowing down at his funeral. Oh, isn't that something? Yeah, right. Uh, did you ever see the president bestow a medal of honor on anybody? I like to watch those ceremonies because they're very, very complex. I love this sir. I don't, it seems to always, I try to exercise a couple times a week. I'm sure you can't believe it, but I do. And it's always that time of the day, about 4 o'clock, I'm finally got this church stuff done, 
and if I turn it on, and President Trump or whoever it is is giving a Medal of Honor, he's seen extraordinary sacrifice in somebody's life. Sometimes it's been from the Korean War, sometimes it's just recent over in Iraq. Extraordinary sacrifice, and he gives them the highest award known to someone in the military. And when you see that happen, it is so very, very humbling. The dignity and the solemnity of that award ceremony, because from that point on forever, they are a Medal of Honor recipient. That's a, such a distinction. If you've ever seen that, I just want to tell you that you've never been to an award ceremony like we'll be to in heaven. I want to be there when James Hudson Taylor, the great missionary to China, gets his Medal of Honor. I'm serious. I want to be there. I knew his great. I knew his grandson in Spring Arbor, Michigan. A great man of God. Two generations later, violently, powerfully on fire for God. Even his grandson. I want to. I want to be there when he gets his. I want. To, I don't want to miss Charles Finney's induction into the Hall of Fame of Faith. Charles Finney saw 500,000 converts that stayed faithful. Face to face. He didn't have Billy Graham's advantage of the television set. He plowed through New York and then through almost all the United States face to face with, with converts. I want to see Billy Graham get his Medal of Honor. Jonathan Edwards, John Wesley, D.L. Moody. I want to see Martin Luther get his Medal of Honor. Martin Luther helped the whole world because he lived for a realm beyond this one. Amen. His daddy, I'm reading in his biography. You always hear the biography, I'm reading but his daddy had the whole thing set up where he would have been the most famous lawyer in that entire part of Germany. It was all set in stone. His father practically disowned him when he decided to become a monk. But let me tell you something. Everybody saw extraordinary giftings in him. And everybody told him, don't waste it in the monastery. Everybody said, get out here where those gifts can be used. And God said, I've got something more important for you. And his, he will be honored throughout eternity for helping the church of Jesus Christ come out of sin. Amen. I want to be there when Kenneth Hagin gets his Medal of Honor. He's changed so many of our lives. I'm so serious. You say, the reason you say, oh, well, he's current, more current. So are you kidding me? That man gave up so much to get this message out. He was scorned. He was ridiculed. Just for saying God's a good God and he wants to bless yeah. your life. I am so deeply grateful. You wait and see if he gets a Medal of Honor in heaven. I want to be there when T.L. Osborne and Oral Roberts, and I definitely want to be there when you get yours. Hallelujah! Yeah. You will. You believe that. But this is a decision we make now. And if you say, well, I'm older, I don't care. Start now. Find a way to make a difference somehow, some way. Get outward focused instead of inward focused. Instead of talking about yourself 55 minutes, talk about everybody else and how you... Hallelujah. Remember this requirement for the Medal of Honor in heaven is not fame. There will be... Mother Teresa, I believe, will get one. I believe she genuinely of God. I don't care if you're Catholic. I don't care who you are. If you love Jesus and you show it, you're going to have them, okay? But you don't have to be Mother Teresa's fame, and you don't have to be Martin Luther's fame. Some people will be there with just as much honor because they did exactly the will of God in the middle of Arizona when nobody else was talk, talking to the Native Americans. Do you understand? Whatever your call is, God will add greatness and worth to your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I just wanted you to see that this isn't the only place that Paul said I didn't hold back. It's just, it's fascinating. I've never understood that. You see, when I hear what he's proud of doing, I think, well, all the beatings and he didn't quit. All the, you know, he got stoned and got up. But he says twice in this chapter, I never got intimidated into not telling the whole truth. Wow. Let's read. 25 to 27 in Acts chapter 20. And now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. Why? Why? One of my worst nightmares is to see somebody getting drugged into hell. And they look at me and they say, you were so blankety blank selfish you did it. Pardon me. I mean, to me, that's the nightmare of all nightmares. How could he say, I am free from the blood of all men. I'm innocent from the blood of all men. Look at the next verse. For I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. 
I understand there might have been more fun messages and or whatever, but you know what? This is the message the Lord gave me today. Because every single one of us has the light of revelation and we wouldn't be here today. And that light of revelation is a tremendous stewardship. If you only know the new birth, if all you know is that Jesus changed your life this weekend, tell everybody that will listen. There's a living God they need to know. If you know about the baptism, tell them. So yes. Tell people, you really need it. I've just changed my life. Music team, there you go. Thank you. Thank you.